And over to you, Slim. Thank you, Patrick. Um, hi, everyone. Happy to be here with you today. Uh, when I was asked to do a workshop for this chromatic weekend, I decided I'd talk about an area that's not often covered in detail, <clears throat> especially with respect to chromatic harmonica. Uh, many chromatic players prefer a non-overdriven, clean, and compelling sound, but without sounding harsh. And sadly, they don't always achieve that. Um, today, we'll be looking at both live and recording situations. We'll be covering microphone basics, uh, what what microphones the pro players are using. Uh, I'll be showing a mic comparison video, uh, talking about signal chains, discussing processing options, and topping all that off with Q&A session, and a bit of playing, uh, should time permit. Uh, as I go through the presentation, uh, which will be fairly intense, inf like an, an information dump, uh, please keep in mind that I've posted all this material, including the slides, videos, and my notes on my website, and I'll display the link to that page at the end. Uh, there's so much to cover, I'll be moving fairly quickly. Uh, so for any note takers out there, don't feel you have to write everything down, as you'll be able to copy paste from my notes after the fact, if you like. Uh, before we get started, uh, just a bit about my background. Uh, I've been playing chromatic for most of my life. I started when I was five years old, back in 1959. Uh, along the way, the guitar stole my attention during my early years, but I got back into chromatic as a young adult and have been playing the darn thing ever since. Uh, I met my multi-instrumentalist wife, Penny Hanna, when she joined my band on bass guitar back in 1973. And we've been playing music together ever since, uh, first in bands and later on the road as a duo for 14 years. The downfall of the live music scene here in the U.S. in the early 90s forced us to get off the road. So I took a day job uh, doing what had become a side gig for me at the time, which was writing music software. Uh, software engineering remained my bread and butter until I retired a couple of years ago. Uh, but Penny and I never stopped playing music together. We've maintained an ever-evolving <clears throat> project studio since the late 70s. Uh, where we've recorded many albums over the years. I've also had the pleasure of performing at several spa shows and produced, mixed, and edited the 2009 West Coast Jazz Harmonica Summit DVD, which features eight different chromatic players, including myself. Um, so, okay, en enough about me. Um, some of what I'll be presenting will be slightly technical in nature. Uh, however, I want to stress up front that none of the technical stuff is as important as using your ears and having the patience to experiment with different setups to see what works best for you and what sounds best to you. Uh, needless to say, a lot of what I'll be saying today is just my opinion uh, based on my own experience, as well as the numerous conversations I've had with other players. So what I'd like to do is share some slides. And Where is it? There it is. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so when it comes to uh, amplifying a recording or recording your harmonica, there are many options for miking. Uh, most of them are pretty good or at least workable, but it helps to match the miking technique to the particular situation. Uh, for live performance, <clears throat> Some of the questions you might ask yourself, uh, will you be playing with other musicians? How loud will you need to be? Will the performance be recorded? Will you be using any stomp boxes or other audio effects? And for studio recording, you might ask, will you be recording with other musicians? And if so, in real time or overdubbing? Uh, if you're not overdubbing, will you be in an isolation booth? Uh, what are the acoustic char characteristics of the room you'll be recording in? And separately, do you use hand effects for vibrato or tonal shaping? Uh, the answer to these questions should impact your mic impact your miking decisions. So let's get started with some basics about microphones. Um, there are two basic types of microphones, dynamic and condenser. Condensers are also referred to as capacitor mics. Under the dynamic banner, there are two subtypes, moving coil and ribbon. What all dynamic mics have in common is that they work via what's called electromatic induction. 
Uh, moving coil mics are the most common type of mic you'll see. They work by using a coil glued to the rear of a diaphragm, which is surrounded by a magnet. Uh, this is similar to speaker construction. They're handy because they don't require external power and can generally take a beating without failing. Ribbon mics are mostly found in recording situations. They tend to be a bit more fragile and are usually more expensive than the more common moving coil dynamic mics. In a ribbon mic, a thin strip of aluminum foil replaces the membrane coil mechanism and can be more accurate than their heavier counterpart. They generally don't have a strong ultra high frequency response when compared to a typical condenser mic. And unless they're built with active electronics requiring phantom power, the output is somewhat weaker and therefore requires a really good mic preamp to cleanly boost the signal. But regardless of these minor drawbacks, ribbon mics are highly regarded for their very natural sound. Note that ribbon mics uh, pick up sound in a figure eight pattern, and I'll have more on that soon. Uh, generally speaking, when someone refers to a dynamic mic, they're referring to moving, the moving coil variety, and we'll specifically use the term ribbon when referring to ribbon mics. But technically, uh, they're both in the dynamic category. Condenser mics use a diaphragm that conducts electricity in close proximity to a metal plate, forming two capacitor plates. Note that a capacitor is a device that holds an electric charge. As the diaphragm moves due to the sound vibration, the capacitance changes, and this is how the sound is con converted to an electronic signal. Due to the very low mass of the diaphragm, it can be more accurate than a dynamic microphone with a moving coil. Condenser mics offer the widest frequency response of all mic types. Condenser mics all, always require an external power source or internal battery, and most professional condenser mics today get this power directly through the mic cord using what's called phantom power. However, uh, tube or valve condensers will have a custom power supply, since the 48 volts supplied via phantom power isn't enough to power the tube. Uh, condenser mics can be any size, and those with large diaphragms, which are typically used in recording situations, are usually the go-to choice for vocals and many instruments, as they tend to sound warmer and generally have a very low noise floor. But small condensers will have a slightly more even response throughout the frequency spectrum. Condenser mics come in all sizes, uh, large, medium, handheld, very small pencil condensers, and teeny tiny electret condensers, uh, which are used for lapel mics or for stage actors. They'll sometimes tape them to hard to see places on the actor's head uh, so you don't see them from a distance. Uh, a polar pattern indicates the directionality of the mic. In other words, how well it will pick up sound from the sides or the back. Uh, here we're showing typical polar pattern diagrams as if the mic we're sitting in the center of each circle pointing towards the top of the page. Each concentric circle represents five additional decibels in sound sensitivity. For instance, um, cardioid example shows a weakening of sig signal at the sides and uh, no signal directly at the back of the mic. Uh, what these diagrams don't show is the decrease in high end as you move away from the area or areas where uh, with the loudest response. Uh, so these are four common polar patterns. Of these, most players will use cardioid or supercardioid for harmonica miking, especially in live situations. With both these patterns, mid-range and high frequencies will be softer as you move away from the front of the mic element and be greatly rejected as you move towards the back of the mic. This helps to reduce the sound that's bouncing off the walls of the room you're in for recording, uh, reduces feedback in a live situation, and reduces bleed from other instruments coming through the mic if you're playing with others. Instrument separation can be especially important in a multi-track recording situation should you want to fix a mistake or replace the part after the fact. Note that the supercardioid pattern shows less pickup of sound from the side of the mic, but some pick up from the back of the microphone. But the sound from the back of the mic will be at much lower volume and have reduced high frequency content. These mics are good if you need to play back from the mic to capture hand effects while rejecting sound from other band members and rejecting feedback. 
but do be careful not to have a sound monitor pointing directly at the back of the mic in order to prevent low frequency feedback. The omnidirectional pattern, which captures sound equally from all sides, uh, can be great if you're in a fantastic sounding environment and you actually want to capture the room sound and or bleed from other instruments. <clears throat> The figure eight pattern captures sound equally from the front and the back of the mic, but rejects sounds from the sides. This, may good, this can be good if you wanna capture whatever sound is coming from behind the mic. Should you really just like the sound of a particular ribbon mic, which by design will have the figure eight pattern, you can put a baffle in back of the mic to reduce unwanted leakage of room sound. With the exception of omnidirectional, mics tend to exhibit what's referred to as the proximity effect. This means that the closer you get to the mic, the greater the, the low frequency response. This is most obvious when using a handheld mic right up against or very close to the harmonica and is exaggerated further when cupping your hands over the harmonica and mic. Also be aware that many large diaphragm condenser mics have selectable polar patterns, so you can choose the best polar pattern for the particular situation with those microphones. So uh, just as a point of reference, um, you'll often hear musicians and audio engineers refer to frequency ranges by name or by specific numbers in hertz or kilohertz. The names of the ranges are not actually standardized, uh, especially with respect to how mid-range is defined. So these numbers and names are approximate. And as with all things audio, I find it's best to rely on your ears when making EQ adjustments but it can be handy to be familiar uh, with these ranges and their corresponding numbers when working with equalizers or when communicating with other musicians or audio engineers. So what follows are some examples of what pro players are using or have used in the past. A lot of the following information came from email, email conversations I've had recently with some top players, but we'll start with some casual observations. Um, I have no idea where this picture was taken, but it's relative, a relatively young Larry Adler, most likely at an NBC studio playing through an RCA ribbon mic <clears throat> that was quite popular at the time and heavily used in radio and recording studios. It was introduced in the 1930s and discontinued in 1955. Toots generally played through a handheld Shure SM58 cupping around the mic. The SM58 is by far the most popular mic for chromatic and is usually handheld close to the harmonica. Um, it, it's also very reasonably priced. Uh, I seem to recall Toots saying in an interview that he preferred this configuration in the studio as well. You get a lot of proximity effect in this configuration and the high end of this mic is pretty smooth. You can then use an equalizer, be it live or in the studio, to tailor the tone to your liking. Uh, the SM58 is currently a terrific value. They're like under $100 in the U.S. and can be purchased with, uh, with or without a handy on-off switch. So, um, you know, who needs a mic that's more expensive than your instrument? In the picture on the left, Stevie is playing live into a vocal mic. Um, not sure what kind, but almost certainly has a cardioid pattern. He's very close to the mic, so monitor feedback isn't much of a problem, and the separation from other instruments makes it easier for the audio engineer to get a good sound. In the older picture on the right, he's in the studio and playing uh, into a large diaphragm condenser. It looks like either a Neumann U67 or U87. Now, I've yet to hear back from Gregoire, Gregoire regarding his mic preferences, but in the live picture on the left, he appears to be playing through a Shure SM58. In the studio picture on the right, it looks like he's playing through both a ribbon mic as well as one of the newer large diaphragm condensers. Tolak Olastad has played harmonica on countless studio sessions and concerts for many great artists. And I'm guessing he's currently the most in-demand chromatic session player worldwide. Uh, in our recent email conversation, he talked at some length on his mic preferences, which I'll summarize here. Uh, for live sessions, he almost always goes for the Shure SM58, uh, like so many players. Uh, he says they are uh, really balanced mics with a lot of presence. That was a quote. <laughs> For home studio work, he prefers the Audio-Technica AT4047, which is not particularly expensive um, for a studio mic, 
Um, he says, quote, I became aware of it from an article about a Tony Bennett duets album where all the vocalists, including Stevie and his harmonica, were recorded with that mic. It sounded great to me, and Phil Ramone, the producer, is apparently a lover of those mics. So I went for it and have always been happy with the results, end quote. Tolak mentioned that when he worked with the legendary late great recording engineer Al Schmidt, Al used a Neumann U67, which is a large diaphragm condenser tube mic, and Tolak said, quote, I have to say that especially on the second Giro album I played on for the song Midnight Sun, I think I love the sound he got on me then better than anything anyone else ever got, end quote. But uh, I would keep in mind, Al Schmidt was perhaps the best audio engineer on the planet, so uh, your mileage could vary. Um, when recording on the road into his laptop, Tolak's been using the Audio-Technica AT4202 USB mic, uh, which is an affordable medium diaphragm cardioid condenser, and he likes that. Uh, Robert Bonfilio uh, performs in most mostly classical music settings and pushes enough air through his harmonica to be heard on top of an, an entire orchestra with, in some concert halls, no amplification whatsoever. <clears throat> uh, when he needs amplification in classical music settings, indoor or outdoor, he'll use a Sennheiser ME4 lapel mic, uh, and he does not attach it to the harmonica, but he just attaches it to his lapel, and he runs that through a wireless system. For other live settings, he uses uh, Greg Human's Ultimate 58, which is a customized Shure SM58 with volume control uh, by Blows Me Away Productions. I have one of these and they're really nice, uh, not only for the volume control and the cool color, but the smaller size compared to the original housing can be more comfortable in the hands. Hendrik Mirkins always uses a handheld Shure SM58 for live use preferably with an on-off switch to silence the mic when he's not playing. In the studio, Hendrik prefers what he describes as a, quote, fat, warm sounding condenser, uh, such as an old Neumann or newer equivalent. Antonio Serrano always uses a Shure SM58 uh, for jazz or other gigs where the band tends to be loud. He used it through the house system with some reverb, and the engineer will usually cut the high frequencies a bit and boost the low mid-range frequencies for what Antonio describes as a, quote, rounder and smoother sound. For classical or acoustic situations, um, when there's no percussion or drums, uh, either live or in the studio, he will sometimes play through a Sennheiser E945 or a great-sounding AKG Neumann or Rode condenser mic. But he cautions that the harmonica tends to sound very thin through condenser mics, and for this reason, he generally prefers the SM58. Uh, for chromatic work, my buddy Rob Paparozzi uh, uses either the Audix Fireball 5 or Greg Human's Ultimate 58 uh, for gig and home studio use. Both of these mics feature a built-in volume control, uh, but the Fireball has less of a proximity effect than the Ultimate 58, so Rob will go with the Ultimate 58 when he's going for a slightly warmer sound. Uh, he hand holds these mics and he prefers to boost the lower mid-range uh, between 200 and 300 hertz by about 8 dB and reduce the high end by about 2.5 dB. Uh, for studio work, Rob prefers either the Neumann KM58 or the Neumann U87. He will ask for EQ adjustments with these microphones to, taint, to tame that high end. Pictured here are just a few of the mics Philip Jarris prefers. For live work, he brings at least two mics to every gig he always brings a Shure SM58 for a nice fat tone. For something a little brighter, he'll go with the Shure Beta 58A. He also likes one of the Bayer Dynamic handhelds, uh, but he didn't mention the model number. And sometimes he'll use an Audio-Technica ATM350, which is a very small condenser for acoustic work, and he holds it between his fingers. In the studio, he likes several mics. 
Uh, there's the Sennhe Sennheiser 441, which he plays on a stand very close to the mic, engaging the proximity effect, as well as the Cardioid Dynamics Sennheiser 421. Uh, the ribbon mics he likes are the Rode NTR as well as the Royer 121, but he also likes the Shure, Sem the Shure SS SM58 for recording. So lots of choices for Philip. Laurent Moir always uses a Shure Beta 58 through a wireless system. He also uses the Beta 58 in studio. For live work, Olivier Carorio made the switch from a Shure SM58 to a Bayer Dynamic M88. He made that switch years ago. Uh, he likes the, quote, warm and round sound. He uses it in the studio as well, coupled with a ribbon mic. He doesn't like the large diaphragm condenser mics favored by vocalists due to the high-end emphasis. This picture from the 2009 West Coast Jazz Harmonica Summit um, is Michael Pelican, and he likes to use hand effects with subtle, for subtle tone variation while he's playing, and that requires a bit of distance between the player and the microphone. The Sennheiser MD441 with its super cardioid pattern is great for this, as it does a good job of rejecting audio that's not emanating from in front of the mic, allowing the audio engineer to tweak the EQ on the harmonica mic without much impact on the sound of other instruments and it also proved to be a good choice during the 24 track mix down of the live recording I had the pleasure of engineering for the DVD. Uh, this is important when you're playing this far away from the mic. Here, um, Hal and Dror Adler are using a different style of close miking, where the mic is attached directly to the instrument and covered, similar to cupping over the mic with lots of proximity effect. The mic is a DA64 developed by Dror. Uh, this is Dora's favorite way to mic harmonicas, uh, both live and in the studio. Uh, the DA64 design was recently copied by Easttop and marketed for less money than Dora was selling them for. Dora told me he's since stopped producing them due to low demand. In the picture on the left, I'm playing live and using an attached mic, uh, and I'm and I'm cupping around it. Uh, the mic is an audio audix. M1250B, which is an example of a pencil condenser. I prefer it for the sparkly high end, uh, lack of harshness in the high mid range when cupped, and for its tolerance of high signal pressure levels, uh, which is important when the mic element uh, is this close to the harmonica. I would not use it without some sort of cupping as it's very thin sounding out in the open air. Uh, this is my preferred live configuration along with some EQ and reverb. I love the sound and it's being attached to the instrument allows me to quickly switch between guitar and harmonica. In the picture on the right, I'm in studio playing cupped in front of a Peluso 2247 SE set to the cardioid pattern. This is a beautiful sounding mic based on a Neumann U47, but a bit more reasonably priced. Uh, when you cup in front of this mic, it's much less harsh while still maintaining a nice high frequency buzz. It's my favorite way to record. Okay, so I put together a video of myself playing the same harmonica part in five different mic configurations and four different playback modes. The soloed sections are there so you can hear the difference between the microphone types in isolation, both cupped and uncupped, and before and after processing. The processing I added was basic, but tailored for each configuration to sound the way I personally wanted to hear it in the context of the rest of the band. <clears throat> One of the points I'm trying to make is that while some mic configurations may sound better than others before processing, you can bring them closer together with a bit of EQ and compression. Uh, subtle differences will always be there. So if you can find and afford your perfect microphone, uh, you'll be a bit happier with the end result. <clears throat> Note that after doing some zoom testing, I replaced the moving images in this video with still images uh, due to the extremely poor rendering of the video over Zoom, but hopefully the audio will come across well. The original video can be viewed from the web page I created for this presentation, and I'll show the link for that at the end. Okay, so now I got to do this bit of sharing here. Uh, and here we 
go over to here and here. Okay. So we're going to start um, with the sol all the harmonicas just soloed with no processing. And we start with the uh, Shure SM58 cupped. And the Audix 1250B also cup. And the Peluso 2247 E47 clone cupped. And the SM58 without a cup. And the Peluso without a cup. Now I'll do the same sequence, but with a backing track. No processing.
and now the same sequence with processing. And next we're going to um, solo the same thing you just heard, but processed. Okay, 
Uh, hopefully that you could hear everything well there. Um, so let's go back to the slideshow. Okay. So uh, whether you're live or in the studio, um, how you set up the signal chain can be quite important. The optimal order of things in your signal chain will depend on exactly what you're using and what type of result you're going for. The important thing to consider is the impact of your choices. Here's just one example. Uh, it's not uncommon for an equalizer to, um, to add a bit of hiss to your signal, especially if you're doing any high-end boosting. If you put a volume pedal before the equalizer, that added hiss will remain constant even when you're, you've cut the instrument volume with the pedal. If you instead put the equalizer before the volume pedal, the added hiss will always be relative to your volume level and will therefore be less noticeable. That's just one example, and it, it's best to experiment with the order of your processing nodes to find the optimum signal chain for your particular setup. The signal chain shown, shown here uh, is therefore just an example of how you might want to set things up. Note that um, this preamp here uh, may, not, may or may not need to be needed uh, depending on what precedes and follows it in the signal chain. Although some people just like the sound of, of a particular preamp. But it, you know, for instance, if your mic is low impedance, as most professional mics are, and you're routing to an equalizer in a stomp box built for electric guitar, you'll either need a mic preamp or a transformer to convert the signal to high impedance before connect, connecting it to the stomp box. Or if your mic requires phantom power, you'll need a preamp or some sort of uh, of some sort to provide the phantom power unless you're going to direct uh, going directly into a unit that has a built-in preamp that supplies that phantom power. The direct box, um, also known as a DI, uh, is also optional uh, if the PA system supports instrument inputs. Uh, here on this track, I'm showing that in the studio, a good way to go um, if you're multi-tracking is to record totally flat and apply all the effects inside the digital audio workstation uh, during playback. This gives you full control over the sound as you're hearing it in the mix. The drawback to this approach is that you won't hear the effects while you're playing. Uh, but personally, I always record flat in order to have more options at mix down, and I've gotten used to uh, what happens when you add the effects. Um, contrary to the studio approach, in a live situation, it's optimal to have a setup uh, where you can easily tweak your EQ and effects while you're rehearsing and or performing, since every room has its own acoustic characteristics. And perhaps even more importantly, uh, to be able to control how you're blending with the other instruments if you're not playing solo. Uh, with respect to effects, uh, there are countless possibilities, including saturation, overdrive, delay, reverb, compression, limiting, harmonizing, chorus, doubler, wah-wah, rotating speaker, amp modeling, speaker modeling, synthesis, and many, many more. <laughs> um, so... Um, Oops. Okay. So uh, now let's um, let's take a brief look at signal processing and the harmonica part. Uh, whether you're playing live or processing a harmonica track in the studio, uh, the basics are the same. There are many things you can do to improve or ruin the harmonica sound with processing. A key point to keep in mind is that the less processing you need to apply, the more organic the end result will sound. Heavily or overprocessed harmonica can be exactly what you're looking for in some cases, but here I'm going to focus more on using processing to subtly shape the, shape the sound uh, so it fits well in the mix. Uh, the video I'm about to show is a screen capture of me taking a uh, <laughs> of me talking through working with EQ, compression, and reverb in my digital audio workstation. Due to time constraints, I won't be covering the multitude of other effects available. I also won't be covering effects for live playing, but the principles used in the studio can generally apply to your live setup as well. So let me sh do another share thing here to get to the video. And 
here we go. Okay, this is my preferred digital audio workstation, Cubase Pro. And I've got the project I used for the mic comparison demo loaded. Uh, this is the track view. And here is the track I want to focus on, um, which is the Uncupture SM58 track. Uh, and it's screaming for a bit of processing, without which we have a very thin and flat harmonica sound. And this is the mixer view. And we can see that this track here, the one we're focusing on, uh, it has a couple of plugins inserted as well as uh, these are the inserts, as well as reverb sends. Uh, let's have a listen to a bit of the fully processed version. And this is the channel view. Uh, it's just the one channel holding the audio track in question. I've got the two inserted plugins here. This is a Fab Filter Equalizer and a Fab Filter Compressor. And I'm also sending uh, to all the three reverbs that are used in this project. I often like to blend in several reverbs with different characteristics. I just use my ears to tell me what's working best on a particular tune. But you can certainly get by with a single reverb. Okay, let's remove all processing for this track to see what we're working with here. Get rid of the EQ, get rid of the compressor, get rid of the reverb sense. See what we got. Okay, that's not um, terrific sounding. Let's uh, put the reverbs back in and see if that helps things at all. Better, but still sounds very thin to my ears. Now let's re-enable the EQ. It's now enabled. With this particular parametric EQ plugin, you can add as many bands as you like. Uh, for this track, I set up three bands boost low mid range, cut high mid range, and slightly boost the very high frequencies. The yellow line that shows the combined changes. Let's turn these all off and reintroduce them one by one. Now the most notable problem that I was hearing is that the high mid range is too loud. So we'll do a cut there. I'll go cut this while it's playing so you can hear the difference. So it's better. Uh, but still not particularly warm sounding. So next uh, let's boost the low mid range. Do the same thing here. I'll start playing it. Boost. So that's already quite a bit better. Um, but still not, um, I'd like to hear a little extra buzz on the high end. So that's what this guy is for. We'll try this one. Now that change, probably not really easy to hear over Zoom, but um, but to me it sounds sounds better in my good monitors. Now let's listen to how these three tweaks together affect the harmonic sound as a whole. So I'm just going to disable the plugin and start playing. And now 
I'll switch it on. So it's better. So before we move on to compression, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, how uh, EQ uh, equalizers work, especially uh, in this case, um, parametric equalizer, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. Um, but I'll just go through the basics really quick, quickly. Um, so you can get a parametric equalizer in a plug-in. You can get one uh, built into your uh, digital audio workstation like this one down here is just like built in. Uh, you can um, get them in a stomp box uh, or you may find a parametric EQ section of an amplifier you're playing through. Um, and basically, um, I'm going to start with a new blank slate here. Um, basically, the way it works is um, you have some number of bands that you can uh, set up and uh, in this plugin, you can set up as many as you like. I'm going to create a new band uh, just to uh, illustrate this. Um, now, um, there are various controls you might have in a, in a parametric EQ. The basic ones are these big knobs here. This is the um, what fr what frequency the band is based at. So let me make this a little bigger. Um, so this, you know, will. Uh, as you change the frequency, um, it you can just see that moving. And um, uh, in fact, let me play a little bit soloed harmonica here. So as I move this through the speak frequency spectrum, you'll hear the sound change. Let's make it just a little more drastic. Increase, decreasing the gain, basically. One more time. Now we can go the other direction. This was a cut. We can to a boost. We can really make some bad sounds if we try hard. Now the other the other control we're seeing here is um, Q and that adjusts the shape of the curve. So how much, you know, how drastic or how broad a frequency range uh, your cut or boost will apply over. And you can see that here. Let's do this way. And it gets very thin. And that can be very useful sometimes if you have a particular frequency that's sticking out a little too much. Okay, enough of that. You may have noticed in the previous playback that some notes are sticking out more than others. Uh, one solution to this <clears throat> in studio or live is for the audio engineer to ride the fader or to automate the level changes. And that can be the best solution for phrases that really stick out. However, it can be beneficial to apply some compression to generally smooth things out. Adding too much compression will sound artificial, and that's okay if that's what you're going for, but generally speaking, you wanna have just enough compression to smooth things out while maintaining a natural and musical sound while preserving basic dynamics. Just like equalizers, compressors come in many different forms, plugins, rack mount units, stomp boxes, etc. The basics are usually the same. Uh, so here are the most common controls. Uh, threshold, this is the level above which compression will kick in. Ratio, when the audio signal rises above the threshold, the amount of compression to apply. For example, a four to one ratio means that if, that if the signal is four dB above the threshold, it will be reduced to one dB over the threshold. So some dynamic content above the threshold is still preserved. It's just less drastic. 
attack. This determines how quickly compression kicks in once the threshold has been reached. Uh, faster attack, uh, too fast an attack can sound artificial or a little startling, and uh, too slow can render it fairly ineffective. Uh, release. Um, this determines how long to wait after the peak before relaxing the compression. So this will kind of like smooth things out the slower the release you have. Um, also note here, and this is not typical for all compressors, but this compressor offers uh, an auto gain feature. And um, when that's enabled, um, it adjusts the overall output level based on the compression parameters. So you don't necessarily have to adjust the instrument level every time you change the compression controls. Okay, so I'm going to engage the compressor while the track is playing. And it's very likely you won't hear a lot of difference, especially over Zoom. But watch the metering in the plug-in, and you'll see the amount of cut being applied whenever the harmonica signal rises above the threshold. Okay, so here we go. Uh, this is uncompressed. Okay, I'm going to kick it in here. So that's basically what we're doing. However, um, just to show you what uh, how you probably don't want to use a compressor and what, what it sounds like when something is overly compressed, uh, let's play around uh, with these parameters while the track's playing. Bring the threshold down. Now you can hear that's not very great sounding. <laughs> okay, so that was that demo. Just a second here. Okay. So um, before we move on to Q&A, uh, just a reminder that you can find all the materials from this presentation at the website shown here. And do feel free to contact me anytime about anything. Um, so I'll leave this slide up for a bit if you want to copy down uh, the web address. Uh, over to you, Patrick. Are you there? Ah, well, while we're waiting for, for, for Patrick, to, uh... Hey, that was really good. Um, ah. Taking this to the higher level. Uh, in fact, I'm now looking back at you from the International Space Station. <laughs> um, and um, I, you know, I'm speaking to you through a Shure SM7B. You didn't mention that. No, I don't actually. Uh, I don't. I know nothing about that, Mike. It's a very, it's a very robust uh, mic, which is actually favoured by soul singers, um, but it's uh, it's got a very, very nice uh, response to the for, for harmonica. So maybe you and I can talk about that some other time. You've sure. a great deal of interest um, uh, because we've got some uh, we've got some questions here in the chat. And, okay. Um, in particular, um, people are really interested in the whole thing about how to get the. Um, the best out of recording the chromatic. Um, so um, Hilbert has asked, um, how do you um, how do you um, minimize breath sounds? Huh. Recording? Yeah, um, and I'll mention you know since we were just talking about compression, that um, as you further compress the harmonica sound, your breath noise is going to go up <laughs> so and you may have even noticed that in the um on the section of the video where uh i was soloing the processed microphones um so uh uh how do you avoid it well 
uh, some people, um, the, a lot can happen by the, with the angle of the microphone, uh, especially if you're hand holding a mic. Um, if you, instead of aiming it uh, directly at the back of the harmonica, if you point it up and then cup around that, if you're cupping, um, that will, uh, that'll be a little, there'll be less wind noise and, and a little less breath noise. Um, uh, some people will use a windscreen. Um, oh, yeah. I, and, um, uh, um, you know, and beyond that, make less breath noise. <laughs> well, it was really noticeable in the example that you had recorded. Yeah, noticeable, hopefully, only w when they were soloed. Right. Yeah. So, so that's, that's key. I mean, if you're going to judge it by the soloed sound and you're actually playing with a band, you know, or a backing track, uh, you know, you might find a little annoying uh, when you play by yourself. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, and again, uh, on that, on the process section uh, of that video, the, um, <clears throat> When it was soloed, um, you know, it was also compressed, and so mm. that brings up any any noise, especially in between the notes. And so, uh, what I would normally do um, uh, as an audio engineer uh, for recording is I would duck those those breath sounds so that um, so, so that they're not heard, yeah. uh, especially in places in the mix where you start to hear them or it's starting to crowd the mix a bit because it's just too noisy. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, uh, this is just one of those things you have to work with. Yeah. L last year, just before lockdown, I made a studio album and the engineer was Derek Nash, who's the old, the tenor sax player for Jules Holland. He's a really, uh -huh. but I don't think he'd recorded the harmonica very much. And when we got to the mixing stage, I was like, I was literally on my knees you know, trying to get him to bring the harmonica forward in the mix. Uh, mm. I was a lot, a lot of the time playing unison choruses with an alto sax player, and and the alto sax seemed to come over more strongly. Yeah, well, you know, uh, I, all I can say is um, either producers or engineers' prerogative. If you're the producer, uh, you get to decide. If uh, if the engineer is the producer, then then they get to decide. Um, but, um, you know, uh, I, I will mention that um, uh, being a multi-instrumentalist myself, uh, whatever instrument I'm playing at the time, uh, when I hear it back in the mix, uh, I generally want it to be too loud. Um, yeah. So, you know, it's kind of a thing um, where it's good to have somebody who has a really good perspective on the mix um, and uh, to make those decisions. Yeah, I, I really am. Um... I must remember to consult you before I make the next album. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> when you're processing a track, uh, uh, ha sorry, I'm not going to go to that. Not, uh, oh, yeah. What order do you um, arrange things in? Um, um, let's just have a look at it. Oh, yeah. What order would you apply? Tuner, compression, reverb. You know, when you're applying the effects, what's the what's the right way to tackle the order? Um, tuner, compression, and re tuner. You mean tuner or equalizer? Oh, well, this is the 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 question. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> a tuner shouldn't impact the sound at all, and a tuner should be able to handle any of those stages, I would think. But um, uh, what was the other one? Uh, compression and reverb. Yeah. Okay. What's, the order, then? What's that? What's the correct order to apply them? Yeah. So I, the tuner, I wouldn't worry about the order too much. Usually you'd put that closest to, to the harmonica mic, uh, yeah. but it really shouldn't matter much. Um, uh, and then next, uh, usually uh, I would do the compression next and, and then reverbs usually just ascend anyway. But even if you're applying it directly to the track, um, if you apply the reverb, uh, before the compression, uh, it can be a good effect. It means that the louder notes are going to have the most reverb. <laughs> um, but if you apply the compression first, it's going to kind of smooth things out before it gets to the reverb. And that way, um, you know, it should be more uh, more realistic sounding. Okay, that sounds like a, a, a really logical sequence. 
And one of the other things that people have been doing have been that um, since you were providing a kind of expert consumer's guide uh, to, to the microphones and the techniques, um, we've got a vote here. Uh, so one person, Leo, is saying, I hear the Shure 58 and the Peluso 2247 are the best. Well, you know, um, everybody's got their preferences. As, as, you, as I mentioned, you know, Toots would use an SM58 even in the studio, you know, because um, he liked the sound. And a lot of people like the sound of that mic. Um, I found um, that I like the, you know, the two mics that I showed myself using uh, in the slideshow. Uh, those are my personal preferences, but I've used an SM58. I've used the, I have, you know, uh, several of them um, and, and they're fine. I didn't like them. I didn't like them very much on um, handheld with a CX-12 uh, because the, C, the shape of the covers of the CX-12 are very horn-like and I think it would accentuate uh, frequencies that I didn't like too much uh, using the SM58, um, which is when I switched to that little tiny pencil condenser that I used attached to the mic. But um, everybody's going to have their own preference. As you saw when um, when I uh, presented all those other players and what they're using, uh, obviously the SM58 uh, is the favorite, you know, uh, for so many players. But everybody's got their their preference. And the great thing about the SM58 is that they're very reasonably priced. Uh, if you're just starting out trying to, you know, um, figure out what mic to use, that's a great place to start. And then over time, you might, you know, try some other mics and go, oh, well, this one yeah, I, I like a little SM, better. SM58 beta myself. And so all the way through your presentation, um, I was kind of zeroing in on the SM58 very closely because I was troubled by a sense of what is the value for money here. So you, <laughs> yeah. uh, you presented a lot of technical aspects and you mentioned uh, value and cost a little bit in passing. But um, don't you think the SM58 is got a, it, it's really presenting a lot of value for money? Because it's... Oh, definitely, definitely, of course. Yeah, the, there's, there, there's hardly anything will beat that at that price. Um, in my view, yeah, um, that's going to go down well with a lot of harmonica players because they they, they always say that um, you don't meet a lot of really rich harmonica players. Uh, they tend to be guitarists. Oh, I don't know about that part, but <laughs> um, well, since uh, Larry, you know, uh, there there's there's there certainly you don't get rich, or most people don't get rich playing harmonica. Um, but a lot of us have other ways we made their, we made our living or are making our living and, uh, can't afford, you know, a better mic or several, <laughs> uh, but, um, uh, you know, it all depends on, I think here's, here's how I'd sum it up. You can get like 90% of the way to a sound that you really like with something like an SM58. If you want to go that extra 10%, you might have to spend a few more thousand dollars. <laughs> there we go. And is there an argument when you're in the studio, if you're an SM58 lover, is there an argument to simply put the SM58 through your usual amp and, and try to get the sound that you get on stage if and you the engineer to acoustically record it as purely as... Sure. Um, of course, uh, if you love the sound you get through your amp um, and um, and you're recording the situation where having it come through an amp isn't going to bleed into the other players microphones if you're playing with other people live in the studio um there's no reason not to mic the amp or you could some some studios will have an isolation booth you can stick the amp in and mic it there yeah. um but i would caution that sometimes in the studio environment when you hear it back um, it's not going to sound like it sound in, you know, in a pub <laughs> or in some even in or in a, even in a good sounding, you know, nightclub or, or concert hall, yeah. um, because the room has a lot to do with that. And so you might find you're a little disappointed with that sound compared to what can be done with a good mic in a good studio mm -hmm. um, without an amp. So yeah. I would just 
that's just a cautionary note, but um, certainly you want to try everything if you can. You know, you want to try all the possibilities of things you think you might like and give it a shot and then compare, you know, if you can afford to do that time-wise um, and studio time-wise. They are very different pathways, aren't they, the, the studio it's ones? too many. <laughs> and it's, it's very gratifying um, when, for example, when you took us through the application of the effects and then you applied them and took them away, that gave us all a really almost like a scientific demonstration of the the value or the lack of value, if you like, sure. of um, adding those um, qualities to the sound. It was very good. We have another question here, which is uh, from Peter T. Do, do you have preferences for a dynamic mic signal booster? A dynamic mic signal booster. Well, I think you're just talking about a preamp. Um, and uh, I, you know, uh, I, I have a few different ones. Um, I don't really have a, a strong preference. Uh, I don't, you know, in my recording and, and live work, I'm not really going for um, a saturation effect or, you know, something to make it fatter just because, you know, with a tube preamp or something that'll add overdrive. I have one and um, it's not bad sounding, you know, but um, uh, I, I just don't really have a preference. I just, you know, uh, for for live work, I use a fairly inexpensive um I use a, uh, a Joe Meek um, unit that has, it's a preamp, which supplies phantom power to my mic, and it has an equalizer built in that I use. Uh, it has compression built in, which I don't use. I don't like that, that particular compressor on my, on my, on my, my harmonica sound. Um, and, uh, and that's fine. It's, I forget how much it costs. I think it was a few hundred dollars. Um, there's some very inexpensive art. ART uh, preamps, uh, you can get them for, geez, well under a hundred dollars US. Um, and uh, and they're fine. Uh, they have a little tube built into them. Uh, I, I I mostly use them for the, uh, for the phantom power uh, mm -hmm. that I need. But, um, uh, and then in, in when recording, I have a, um, uh, a warm audio uh, preamp, which is quite nice. Um, that in uh but i you know i can't say it adds that much to the sound personally some people swear by a particular preamp or or just have to have a preamp uh because they think it helps the sound uh you're, you're i, I can go with or without it <laughs> you're staying around later on you'll be hearing uh neil warren who's one of our outstanding chromatic players he's, he's going to be running the jam session mm -hmm. i just want to draw everybody's attention to that we're coming to the end of our time now with slim and uh, I'd like to say that it's been a really fantastic insight into the whole world of recording. And we've been given a really high quality, detailed analysis of what you need to take into the studio and, and really how you need to listen very closely to the sound of your, your instrument. Um, uh, Neil's got a, just a final question that maybe we could finish off with. Um, I just let me just interrupt you. Um, Roger is going to kill me if I don't play something. And if we're running out of time, I better do that now. That's a cool idea. OK, let's go ahead with that. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much. So Slim Halpin is going to play us out. Thank, Thank you.
Thank you, Slim. Thank you, Slim. That was absolutely brilliant and a great way to finish. Yeah, thank you all. It's uh, Slim, Mr. Pete. I'd like to thank you on behalf of Harmony UK for coming uh, this evening and uh, presenting. And that was an absolutely fascinating um, subject, and I've been glued to the screen. So oh, thank uh, you. And uh, thank you, Patty, for presenting as well. My pleasure. Great stuff. Are, are you able to go to the green room to meet anybody? Yes. Um, I'll take a short pause and then I will go to the green room and see what's happening. Good stuff. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Slim. Thank you, Patty. Thank you. Mm -hmm.